Hello and thank you for joining me. This video is going to be a little different from the ones I've done so far because what I want to do is look at a set of rules I've come across. Um, in fact, I'd like to try them out on the table and see how I get along with them. And a bit of uh, context for you. Um, I've thought for a while now that what I wanted to do with my wargaming was to reenact real battles and I've been looking for a set of rules that would enable me to do that uh, on the tabletop um, and that meant I wanted to look at rules that dealt with the problems of a, a, a corps in, in Napoleonic terms or an army commander um, and looking around at what the, the big battle rules that were available they were all of a of the same kind of ilk. They all had the same basic components. There'd be a, a movement phase, there'd be a shooting phase, a charging phase, a melee phase, a morale phase, sometimes a control phase where you found out you couldn't order everything. Um, but it didn't really, in my mind, go to the heart of what an army commander might be doing. And all those individual things, while they might be interesting, they would be devolved down to lower levels of command within an army. And in a game which incorporated those, it would kind of slow it down. So I was looking for a long time to see if I could find a set of rules. And I couldn't really find anything that I thought was going to work for me. Um, particularly for the period of the Seven Years' War, which is what I was working towards. However, uh, I came across um, a set of rules, or a series of sets of rules, published through the Pike and Schultz Society, um, specifically uh, the Twilight of the Sun King. And while I was looking at this, I saw they were also beginning to develop a set of these rules for the Seven Years' War. So I thought, I'll get a copy of The Twilight of the Sun King, which is for the War of Spanish Succession, and see if I can get a feel for how the mechanics work. And it is a very different approach to wargaming. And that's what I'd like to sort of share with you now. And if I can get this to work, I'll try to show you one of the scenarios that the Twilight of the Sun King is based on. Um, so these are the rules. Um, they're very different and I think they might take a little getting used to. They have only three phases uh, in a turn. The first is a bombardment phase by the non-phasing player. Then you have a morale phase and then finally you have a movement phase. There's no shooting phase, no combat phase, no charge phase. Um, everything comes down to the morale of the unit uh, and the support it's got and the circumstance it finds itself in when it comes into uh, what would be firefight range or close combat range. Um, that gives it a very different feel uh, from the sort of more normal games that exist. So Twilight of the Sun King enables you to pay, play at two scales. The standard scale is a unit equals a brigade. And then there's a second scale where a unit equals a regiment. I will be using the standard scale, so a unit is a brigade. And in front of you here is a unit. Um, the rules have the unit made up of two bases. I've got mine structured with four. Uh, I don't think it matters too much. Um, a unit can form three formations. A line, as you see here. It can also have a march column. Um, which is very much as you would expect. Like that. Uh, and it can form a 
a square, although that was very uncommon. Um, but it is a possibility. Something like that. Now, movement in the game is based on base widths. And the brigade, the the infantry unit and the cavalry unit have a frontage of two base widths and everything is measured in base width so a base width is two stands here and on my figure setup that is 50 millimeters the battle of almanza took place in 1707 between the French and Spanish Bourbon army of Louis XIV and a Confederate army uh, under the command of Lord Galloway. Uh, in front of you, we have my French Seven Years' War proxying for the Bourbon forces, and they slightly outnumber the forces of the Confederation. Um, I shall go around and have a look from the other side here. This is the Confederate side of the battlefield. Now, as a scenario, this is one of the smaller scenarios. Um, it's 20 base widths by 20 base widths, which on my basis comes to a metre square. Uh, and as you can see, there's not a lot of room on the flanks here. It's going to be a straight up fight. Um, the scenario defines the uh, the little river and the pool as needing an action test to pass. And action tests are one of the two test mechanics that the rules have. And we'll go into those as we get closer. Now, what I'm going to try and do is uh, play a few turns through and show you how the mechanics work as far as I can tell. This is the first time I've tried these rules, so I will probably get stuff wrong, but um, it's always a learning curve, isn't it? Now, I don't think this scenario says, but, I th but from reading about the battle, it seems to me that the Confederate forces uh, will start the battle, so that's what I will do. Um, right, so to start, the very first phase is the bombarding phase from the non-phasing player. In this instance, because the Confederates are going first, bombardment can happen from the Bourbon side of the table. Now a couple of things to note here. First is the range of artillery is 10 base widths, so on my scale that is 50 centimetres. So you automatically start within range. The second thing to note is that friendly troops do not block line of sight. Now this is a little bit of a conceptual problem because uh, it doesn't quite look right to me. But the rationale is that because these are brigades, there is a lot of gaps between them even though it doesn't show. And the artillery are deemed to be firing through those gaps. Um, this, third thing to note is that the arc of fire on the artillery is 30 degrees to the left and the right. So as long as you can trace from that to your target, and generally speaking your target should be a front rank unit, um, you can bombard it. If you bombard, your artillery will not be able to take part in any uh, close range activity which takes place in another phase. But in this instance, because the, the armies are so far apart, that's not going to be a problem. Now, bombardment works simply by identifying your target. Uh, in this case, this artillery battery will identify that, and I will mark that with a bombardment. Um, the second battery will also fire, and I will fire on this one. I don't have to roll for those, uh, I 
just nominate the target I want. And I could concentrate on the same target, provided the batteries are in arc and in range. Uh, and multiple hits have different effects that can be chosen by the phasing, by the, by the bombarding player. Um, so, that's what we've done in the, in the bombardment phase. The second phase is morale. Now at the moment, there are no morale tests to be taken. So in the first plan, there's no morale to take. Um, had two batteries fired on this one, then there would be a morale test on here, because two bombardments can force a morale test, as far as I can see. Um, but that isn't the case here. So, we're going to do the next phase now, which is to the third phase, which is to move. Um, and moving is done in multiples of base widths. Now, in line, in good going, uh, infantry, I think, move three base widths. Uh, cavalry, I think, can move six base widths. So, um, the Confederate Army is going to advance. Now, passing through units isn't a problem here either. Um, so, these will move. Well, they won't move the four, six. These will move three, because this particular side of the command has got some infantry supporting it. And I don't want to get too far out of the infantry because my cavalry is weaker than the Bourbon cavalry. So we will move at the speed of the infantry. Now, a straightforward move it requires no additional uh, action to be taken. If there is a more difficult move, a uh, change of formation, a uh, change of direction, crossing a, an obstacle, um, or indeed if it's under bombardment, then before it can move, the unit has to take an action test. So, on this side, uh, these six units here, none of those have had, and they're not under bombardment, they're going in good going, so these can just advance. So I'm going to advance uh, 150 here with this group of units. Now, you may notice that uh, these cavalry units are based slightly differently from the French, and that's because uh, I haven't got around to rebasing them. It's a big job and I'm putting it off. I'll finish the French first and then work out what I'm going to do. Um, the same is true of these infantry. Generals move first, so um, I should move these generals first. Um, now, these two units have been subject to bombardment. They've been bombarded by one battery each, which means that they have to take a, an action test. An action test is very simple. Um, the basic roll is on a d6, and they need to get a four, five, uh, three, four, five, or six to pass. 
if they've taken a bra test already in this term, then that would increase it to or decrease the chance of passing from, uh, from 3, 4, 5, 6 to 4, 5, 6. But these have just taken it. So this first one is going to try and advance. He was a 4, so he is fine. Uh, so he can go to there. And the action does not have come away. This one attempts to come, and he's fine as well. So he's moved to there. Now crossing this little stream will require an action test when they get to it. Uh, these little villages are difficult going and there are some restrictions on what can happen if somebody goes through a village. Uh, it slows you down in the first case and cavalry cannot pass through difficult terrain in line. If cavalry want to pass through difficult terrain they have to do it in march column. So I'm kind of assuming there's an inch around each of these buildings, which is the difficult area. Um, and so if the cavalry wants to go through that, it's either going to have to avoid that inch around, or it's going to have to go into march column to go through. Now given how close the enemy cavalry is, it wouldn't be sensible to try and go through in uh, march column. So. I think what I'm going to do here, I think I'm going to advance the infantry forward uh, and bring the cavalry up to the river but not go through at the moment. So these don't have to do any action tests because it's a straightforward movement. Um, so you will advance to the River. They won't go into the river, they'll just advance the river. Uh, I will actually do an action test on this to turn it um, into a column and move it across. They're not going to be able to get me too quickly, so that needs an action move. So A fails. Now, one of the things a general can do in line of command, if he has command points, is use those to re-roll failed tests. But you've got to take the result of the failed test, so he will do that. And he still failed. So, uh, that is not going to pass. Um, I'm not sure if I can then move through something that's failed an action move, but in this instance I won't do that. So that I'll move these forward. Move him forward to there. And I will try to move this one into a column onto the side here, which you can do. So they turn into a column and move half move, I think that's how it works. Right. So that is the Confederate first move. Right, this is the Mormon response to that first move. And looking at it, I think my plan would be to hold for them to come forward, to uh, allow them to come into the defile, or 
the constricted area between the pool and the uh, edge of the, the table uh, and fight them there. Um, so we we'll get on with this second move then. The first thing is that the Confederates artillery can bombard and they will do this. Um, <clears throat> I think the first thing they'll do is try to uh, engage with the cavalry on the flank and this battery here will try to weaken the centre. Right, so no unit has got uh, two bombardment tokens, so there are no units at the moment doing morale tests. Um, so we can move straight to the action phase. And as my intention is to allow the Confederates to come forward, I'm not going to try and act at all. So the only impact of these two bombardments would have been to put action tests on them. So that is no longer uh, important. Um, the first thing we do is move the generals, and I will move him to here, uh, and he will move out to command his cavalry. Um, now I will move, or attempt to move this rear unit across to support the centre. That will require a an action test because I want to turn into uh, a column move across uh, so yes he gets a three he passes so they turn into a column and then they can move half a half a move which takes us to that position And that is the end of the Bourbon phase. So moving back to the Confederates. Uh, so, again starting off with Bombardment, the Warman guns will attempt to engage uh, and disrupt the advance over here. Uh, I think we'll fire on this battalion this time. Um, and this battalion. Or brigade. I, I still think of those terms of battalions, but these are brigades. So if they want to move, they have to take an action test. Now again, we're going to advance at the pace of the infantry. So these don't have to do any action tests because they are just going straight ahead. So this, wish, this, this brigade wants to move forward, so it needs to do an action test. So he will roll a six. So he is fine. So he will again move to. So he, that, that is nice. That goes off. Right, this brigade is going to try and advance forward. It will try to advance 
through the uh, pond. So that will require an action test. So that means it has an action test for the artillery and it has a second action test for going through that. It's going to pass both of those. So the first one for the artillery, he passes. So that goes away. And then the second one for the pond, he passes. So he is advancing forward. splashing through the pond. This chap is also, the supporting brigade is going to come forward and he's going to go to the pond, so he will have a go. He fails. Now, the general is not close enough to do it, so that failure stands. Um, so he will advance to the pond and stop there. I'm not sure exactly if that's how it works, but that's how I'm going to play it for the time being. There is now a gap between those two units, um, and that is significant. Um, one of the key things about this is reserves and you have to be within half a base width to be giving support to the troops in front. This is no longer supporting the lead troop. Right, over here, he will advance straight ahead to the river. He will not try to cross it. This battalion behind will advance straight ahead, behind the lead camera unit. And that is the end of the Confederates' second turn. Moving on to the Bourbon second turn. So the first thing that happens is the Confederate will fire. Now, I will try to concentrate my fire my two batteries on this one unit here. So within 30 degrees of those two. And that will force a morale test. Um, so we now move to the second phase and that is morale tests. And the way these work is they use two average dice. Now, I don't have average dice. I used to have average dice years ago, and most, most war gamers did, I think, particularly ancient war gamers. Uh, but we'll treat a 1 as if it were a 3, and a 6 as if it were a 4. Now, the object of the exercise is to get an 8 or more to pass. If you get less than that, if you get a 5 to a 7, you fail the morale test, and that will begin to decrease the effectiveness of your unit. These losses cannot be recouped in the game. And for most units, most infantry units, once you've taken three losses, you are deemed to be destroyed, routed, uh, to leave the field. Um, so, we're doing morale tests because of the artillery. So here is the first roll. I get a six and a three. So the 6 is actually a 4, so that gives us 7. And we add on to that uh, some factors. So I'm not, I'm not an elite unit, I'm not in buildings, 
I'm not uphill, I'm not in fortifications. I am in line, but I don't have rear support because this isn't facing the same direction. But that would have given me some extra pluses. I do get a plus one for only fired on by artillery at more than three base widths. So that will take me up to eight. Right, then there are some minuses. The moment there are no minuses. So eight is a skin of the teeth pass. So that is successful. So after morale test we get to movement. I'm going to move my general first. I'm now going to try and move this one. Uh, continue moving for a half move and then turn into line so I can give rear support. So this is an action test, and I roll a 4. So they move forward and turn to face. I did forget one thing. Uh, the general can use his, depending on his command, uh, tells you how good a commander he is and they are rated from 3 to 0. They can use their uh, command skill, as it were, uh, the number of times that they have pips, effectively. So it's a 2 general. He can do two things. He can reroll two tests, or in fact he could ask a unit to move a second time, or maybe even a third time. Um, so the quality of the commander is quite important in here for getting things done. Um, these are, the wing commanders here are one, so they've only got one action they can take. So he's just used his action to get there. So that is the end of the Borgon second turn. Okay, this is now the Confederate third turn. And we start with the Bourbon bombardment phase. Now, if they bombard now, they won't be able to engage in the combat should it happen. So this battery will reserve its fire. This one will attempt to bombard this chap here. So he will do the bombardment there. <coughs> that moves on to morale test. There are no morale tests. So we're now in movement. Now, my intention here is to, to charge in. Now, all charges need action tests. So the first thing we'll do is we'll move the general <coughs> forward. We'll move the C and C forward. Generals move first. <coughs> move him forward. Now we want to move the cavalry and the infantry into combat. So, we have to do an action test. We'll do this action test first. Four. So he's fine. So he moves into combat. In combat, your units have to line up. They can't come in overlapping half of it and the other. They have to, uh, they have to face off exactly against their target. Um, the second unit 
It was a fool, so he goes into combat. And the supporting units uh, will move up. Now, to act as a support, a cavalry unit has to be within a base depth, a uh, base width behind, and an infantry unit needs to be half a base width behind. This Jack wants to try and assault. He rolls a three, so he does. This guy will try to assault. He rolls a two. But the general here, who is a Two level general will try to re-roll that. He rolls another two, but because he's a two, he can try one more time and he gets it. Now <coughs> I also want this. Oh, so this one will move up in support here. I also want this one to charge in, but again he's got a, an action test for the bombardment, he's got an action test for the pond, and he has an action test for charging. So he needs to pass three action tests. There is no general there to help him out, so he needs to pass all these three. And he passes two but fails one. Um, so he has not been able to engage. This chap will try to come behind to come in sport range. So he needs an action test to go forward and he fails. There is no general to help him again. So that is that is where we are after the movement phase. I'm going to end it there so I can have a look at the rules and see how the next bit plays out. <coughs> right. That appears to be the end of the Confederate turn. Now, this is the first time I've tried this, so I'm not sure I'm doing this right, but it seems that that's the end of the Confederate player's turn. So we now move to the Bourbon player's turn. And then we have this circumstance. This gun will not fire because it is in combat. Or it's going to be using its combat thing. This one will bombard. So it will put in bombardment on him. We then go to the morale phase. And the Bourbon player has to test its units requiring morale. So, in base to base contact with an enemy is a cause for a morale test. So, we have four of those to do. So, we'll take the first one. So, we roll our two average dice. Uh, and that gives us a 4. This one has a 4. So we then go down the modifiers. So it's not only a unit, it's not in buildings, it's not uphill, it's not infantry, it's not... It is in line with rear support uh, within one base width for cavalry. So that takes it up to 5. It's in contact, so... Right. In the turn after being charged by a cavalry unit. Minus one. Takes this down to two. So that is a four result. 
which is the worst it can roll. Uh, and it breaks immediately and it's very really important. That didn't go great for the Bourbons, but the Confederates are quite pleased by that. Right, let's try the second one. Uh, again, two average dice. So that is a four, that goes to a four. So this starts on an eight. Uh, and the same applies. So it gets a rear support, so it takes it to nine, but it's cavalry charge takes it to uh, eight. Um, now, does it have an unsecure flank? Are these things simultaneous or are they in sequence? We'll say they're simultaneous at the moment. So that gives it an eight, which means it is fine. It hasn't taken any casualties. We'll try the next one. So that gets a, that goes to a three. So that's got a six. It has rear support, so that goes to seven. Um, I think it's on a 7, so that takes a failed morale. So that has taken one failed morale. It takes two more and it rounds. And the next one along, same thing. That turns to a 4, so that is 8. So uh, one support, so that's 9, so that has taken no morale hit. We can then do actions. Right, that was the morale test phase. New actions. Uh, I want this unit to charge in. So he's got to do a an action test for going into the front. So that's a four. So he will go into the front of that one there. Right. And that should be the end of the Bourbon players' turn. I'm going to call it there uh, because we've now seen how the most of the main mechanics work. Um, and I'll probably go away and read the rule book again. But I hope that's been interesting. Certainly for me. Uh, yeah, to get a feel for it has been quite useful.